start the show. Okay. Good afternoon. I know uh, you guys are fading a little bit, so hopefully we'll keep this short and sweet. Um, I'm Pac Rob, I will be discussing with you guys, reviewing a common injury that most of us in the community see, uh, both through friends and family, as well as physicians and extenders who are involved with their care. Hip fractures, it affects everyone. Um, it is a common thing, so we're just gonna review some things about what's the staple, what's changed, what hasn't. Hip fractures, you divide them uh, by location on the top portion of the femur. There's peritrochanteric fractures and then there's femoral neck fractures. Under the peritrochanteric fracture, there's intertroch and then subtroch, which means it extends below uh, into the shaft. And we're just gonna review that quickly. Who gets them? Uh, young and old, generally speaking, the elderly population unfortunately falls uh, as a large uh, amount of these patients because of fragility. Uh, and uh, and they're usually uh, and their balance issues. As a result, they suffer mechanical falls and they sustain these injuries. Uh, it occurs to both men and women, but unfortunately, women do uh, make up the large portion of these uh, fractures, almost 80 percent. Uh, intertrochanteric fractures or peritrochanteric fractures do occur in the young patient, but generally, it is a high uh, energy um, event, following usually a motor vehicle accident. Their occurrence is actually generally low. So you don't really see them, but you uh, come uh, a significant amount. Uh, so OTA classification divides it into three areas, going from uh, from uh, left to right. Um, this is a, this is a general uh, inner choke. Here, as it extends down to the lesser choke, it becomes a subtroke, and here's the more classic subtroke fractures. Stable versus unstable, uh, we're gonna get into that, but it's defined basically on the in, uh, integrity of this area of the uh, hip. It's called the lesser troch and calcar where there's a posterior medial uh, buttress, which is a strong portion of the bone. You need to sort of address that as far as uh, stability. Surgical timing, it has come much in the forefront. Generally, we need to get these patients, particularly the elderly patient, into the OR, needs to, earlier is always better. Uh, there's been a lot of research uh, done in the literature and event planning as far as what's the optimal time. 24 hours is the ideal. Try to expedite them, try to uh, sort of triage the patients who can't get there, optimize them from a medical standpoint, and then accomplish the uh, surgical fixation. It is a multi disciplinary approach. You do need everyone involved, uh, meaning uh, from the ER staff, uh, to the uh, medical colleagues, to the surgeon, and, and, it, and it's just the best way to accomplish this, to minimize those risks. Here's a, re a quick review, recently done in 2017. They try to see if there's a difference to uh, significantly from 48 hours to under 24 hours, and they found that it does make a difference, particularly in the first 30 days, their mortality will drop down significantly. So it's ideal, again, if you can get the patient to the OR within 24 hours, it yields the best results. Surgical fixation. Here's an example of uh, something that's been around a long time. It's called a, a sliding hip screw. Um, <clears throat> as you see, it's a side plate with a screw that goes into the femoral head, um, and it, it works well. Uh, here's the idea of the fracture. As you can see, this is what we call a load uh, bearing because the metal will actually bear most of the weight as this fracture heals. Here's a more uh, newer or modern technique. It's a nail. It's called a cephamedullary nail fixation, meaning there's fixation into the head of the femur and then down the inter intermedullary uh, canal. Fracture patterns. As we reviewed before, it does matter because it's going to direct you on how you're going to treat them. You know, uh, the stable patterns, you can use either of the fixations that I just showed you. Uh, it's really up to the surgeon what he or she prefers to accomplish the task. The unstable pattern, which is where it, it does separate, and the more indicated or the indicated treatment is the uh, nailing. 
implant. Just to review, sliding hip screw, it's, it's been a long, a long time. Uh, the popularity has lessened over uh, my career, particularly now with the cephalometry nail fixation because of the ease and, this, and, the, um, and the system to, in, uh, to implant it. It's become much more facilitated. But here's some pros. Uh, dynamic compression, which is ideal when you're trying to heal fractures. Uh, low cost, and you do, spell, you do spare the hip abductors, which uh, comes into play when you're trying to recover these patients as far as their walking and their gait. What are the cons? Unfortunately, that you do have to open the fracture, so there's more morbidity in that. Um, there's also, uh, depending on the fracture pattern and the bone quality, there may be more significant shortening through the fracture and, and um, as far as the alignment. The, uh, the nail version. Pros, percutaneous, again, you can get pretty skilled when you do, when you get experience where the incisions are very small, the blood loss is small, the time can potentially be a lot shorter depending on how, how, how common it gets for you to do it. The costs are a, a con, unfortunately. And then there's that topic about the hip abductors, which I just spo spoke to you. It can, depending on the patient's fitness, it can get in the way as far as them recovering their mobility. Intertrochanteric fractures, again, the stability is based on that buttress that we talk about, which you see right here and you see right there. Depending on how much comminutia or uh, fragmentation is there, we'll sort of let you know how stable the fracture will be when you reduce it. So here is uh, unstable fracture. Why? Because of the uh, the comminutia here and the fracture pattern as it goes over here into the shaft. And it's not what we call, it's called a reverse obliquity. Typical fracture goes from, from the greater choke to the lesser choke. Uh, when it goes in the opposite direction, it signifies more instability because of the uh, bone quality and the lack of buttress that you're going to have. I'm just going to say a few words about the lateral wall. It's something that, that comes into play. It's this, the integrity from the greater choke down to the shaft. The reason it's important, it, it's particularly going to help you when you're selecting your implant. When this is intact, you can use your dynamic compression screw or sliding hip screw safely because it's gonna, it ha, it, that fixation needs this wall to be there. If this doesn't exist or there's no continuity, you should think twice about using that implant because the likelihood will, it can fail. Q, Q, <laughs> Uh, a few words about the tip apex distance. What does it mean? This is a lot of formulas and math to probably discuss right now, but the idea is that you want to get your screw centered in the head and as close to this area of the bone. That is the bone quality that is strongest in the hip area as we age. As we age, this all hollows out. So if you leave it too far or too high, the likelihood of this screw cutting out or collapsing becomes increased. Again, more of the math than the formulas, but you get the point there. Here's an example of this uh, sort of uh, less than ideal uh, implant or, or uh, placement. So here's an unstable fracture. That lateral wall is not there. Um, you go ahead and try to fix it. What happens is the, the screw goes a little too high, not centered, the bone quality is poor, and there's not that into, um, continuity as a result you're asking the uh, fixation to do a little too much work than it should. And this is what's, if you look at the, le at the right here, this is what's starting to happen. It's starting to fail, it's starting to move away from the midline. Here's a another example, um, very similar fracture pattern to the one I just showed. As you can see, lateral wall is not there, a lot of comminutia. Fragmentation. You go to the OR, you realign them, you've restored the lateral, uh, the alignment. The difference between this implant versus the sliding hip screw is that the, this is what they call a load sharing and the axis of the device is more anatomic in the canal. As a result, um, it benefits from the uh, surrounding bone to share that stress. All right, let's move on to uh, hip fractures, femoral neck specifically. 
There are four types. Here's a common uh, classification we've used. It's called the garden classification. It divides it into four fracture patterns going from a simple to where the, the head is no longer articulating. Who gets these fractures? Again, uh, it's bimodal, uh, elderly and young. Elderly is usually a, a low energy mechanical fall. Again, unfortunately, women uh, win this race. It's more common in women versus men. Um, in the younger population, which do see them, uh, it's typically high energy, as we would expect, but the incurrence is greater in men than women. Generally, most men at that younger age have poor decision making and bad luck, and we get these fractures. Blood supply, it, it does become a factor in this fracture, particularly um, the location of the fracture of the artery. The main artery that contributes uh, blood supply to the head is the medial circumflex. As you see, it's proximity around the neck where the t common fractures are gonna be. It is at risk to be injured. And unfortunately, you can't always repair or recover that uh, vascular supply. Pheromone X, you divide them into stable and unstable. Going back to the garden classification, you'll see the type one and twos stable. They're probably gonna hold their alignment. You just have to reinforce it. Unstable, you have to decide how you're gonna fix it and depending what the population is. Paul's classification, it's another classification that helps define um, the fracture line and give um, some insight to the outcome. Generally, what's gonna happen is you go from left to right, the fracture pattern becomes more vertical. Generally, as a rule, it's associated with higher energy, uh, so the, and also as far as um, outcomes, there's a high risk of avascular necrosis when the femoral head will fail or die because of that lack of uh, blood supply in this type of pattern. How do you uh, diagnose them? Most of the time, plain radiographs are sufficient. Sometimes there's any concerns. We usually get a CAT scan, and often in the elderly, if you're suspicious and not clear, but they're having hip pain, uh, we've gone over to MRI versus a traditional bone scan. Non-operative treatments. It's something to be discussed. Is it a common thing? Uh, not very common. Generally speaking, it's reserved for the patients who, are, who have you know, non-displaced, minimal ambulators, a lot of comorbidities where they put them at high risk to go to the surgical uh, treatment. Surgical treatment. The types of surgical treatment, open reduction, internal fixation, and arthroplasty. Under ORIF, there's two uh, common uh, usages cannulated screws and the sliding hip screw with a derotational screw. Um, and that's done so the screw, which is in the middle of the head, does not rotate. So you need to fixate both so otherwise it'll spin around itself as you insert it. Surgical timing. Like with the intertrochanteric fracture, um, there is an urgency to it. The question is how urgent and when should you do it? Recent update of the literature demonstrate you don't have to kill yourself. You don't have to do this in the middle of the night, but you should fix them in, in a reasonable expedited fashion because again, you don't want the comorbidities of the patient laying around waiting for this to get done. Here's some examples of the recent literatures and searches of the uh, pointed out. Here's one in international orthopedics where they reviewed patients under 60. What was the risk of osteonecrosis? Did it matter of when they did it and how they did it? Another similar uh, study, a little older, in 2004. What do we conclude? This is all done, to again, to minimize the risk of avascular necrosis, particularly in the younger patient, uh, because the outcomes can be significant. Um, where, again, as we talked about before, total hip arthroplasty when it can occur, and you don't want, you want to avoid that in the young patient because of the longevity of the artificial hip. So it, it can happen up to 30%. Um, in patients, even with good to excellent results, meaning even if you get the hip perfect and you've got it reduced and you feel good about yourself, 30% of them are going to get uh, AVN anyway. And why does that happen? Well, it has to do with the fracture pattern. Factors that do affect the outcome are going to be the fracture pattern, the initial displacement, and that posterior comminutia, which is along the cortex in the back, where the bone is the strongest. Generally speaking, that's going to happen in a high energy patient or uh, mechanism, which is going to cause the problems. The other uh, influence that you can try to control is the accurate anatomic reduction. If you have the ability to do so, do it the best you can, get it as lined up as you can, because otherwise it, 
likelihood of them uh, giving AVN will be higher. Factors that do not affect that outcome are going to be the timing. You don't have to, again, lose sleep in the middle of the night, not be at your best. It is better to wait, uh, if you can, within reason, to get there when, when the team is ideal and the OR is ideal as best you can. Obviously, I don't say you should persons who wait three to four days while you're on vacation or, or when your partner gets back. It should be something expedited. And then open versus closed reduction. There have been some debates about, you know, is it important to go in there, release the capsule where there's bleeding? Does that help the pressure of the vasculature and so forth? It, it, based on the uh, uh, review of literature, it doesn't have any influence. You just fix it the best way you can. If you, you're better at opening it and you feel better with that, that sort of uh, approach, then oh, go ahead and open it. If you want to keep it closed where you can realign it and that's accurate in your hands, then that's reasonable. In summary, hip fractures in the elderly patients, again, expedite their optimization, get them to the OR as quickly as you can. Ideally, we should do it within 24 hours. Hip fractures in the younger patient, accurate anatomic reduction, poor outcomes even in the best hands, up to 30% of the population. Any questions?